Hey, welcome back. This review is a little different than the rest. First of all, you can still buy this game, unlike most of the games I've reviewed so far. This might change in the near future. At one point, you could purchase this game on both GOG and Steam and probably other digital distribution sites. However, the company that owns the right to the game filed for bankruptcy and was bought out by another company. GOG isn't selling this game anymore, yet Steam is. Now, because Steam has a habit of being the last to remove games from their shelves, you have limited time left to buy before you have to resort to getting a physical copy of the game from eBay. Here's the game. For anyone on the fence of buying this game and wanting to avoid spoilers, this is the first screen. And it's nothing more than a tutorial for learning how to point and click. There's no spoilers here, don't worry. You could press the spacebar and have all the points of interest highlighted for you. I wish more point and clicks did this to get rid of pixel hunting. You don't have to use it if you don't want to. It's just a handy tool to have just in case you want to read all the flavor text. The pre-rendered backgrounds are great, and the house you start in has plenty to look at. The character models on the other hand are not as good. The models look great, but the animations are really rigid. You can see it a lot with the talking heads in the dialog box. A static 2D drawing of the characters expressing emotion probably would have been better here. The story has a slow start, but it's good, and the puzzles aren't hard. I only had to use a guide once because I forgot to pick up an item rewarded for completing a puzzle. That's all I can think to say without spoiling anything. So if you don't want spoilers, you should probably get out of here and buy the game. Okay, so how did we get in this fancy house? Our protagonist is named Sam, and she's on her way to London when she makes a wrong turn and winds up going to Oxford instead. She stops at a house and spies someone rehearsing her introduction as a doctor's new assistant. She gets scared off by a black trash bag. And Sam pretends to be the new assistant. Sam's first order of business, after waking up in the morning, is to figure out where she is and leave the place without anyone noticing. Uh -oh. Naturally, the housekeeper, Mrs. Dalton, finds us and now we're stuck being the new assistant. Now, our first order is as the new assistant is to find six willing test subjects for the doctor's experiment. Now's a good time to mention that this is a house for the cognitively impaired that's not raising any suspicious flags or anything. Unfortunately for us, the doctor is known all around Oxford, and everyone thinks he's a crazy person for some unknown reason. Sam gets the idea that the incoming freshmen probably haven't heard of the doctor just yet, so she goes to the freshman dorm for willing lab rats. She succeeds in finding willing test subjects, but they need a little convincing first. Naturally, just use some magic, and boom, they're on their way to the testing room. That phone is about to ring. I can feel it. Hello? This is Sam Everett. Terrific. Thank you so much. I'll see you tonight. Oh, by the way, Sam is a street magician. And performing tricks is the majority of the puzzles. I'm using that term loosely because you're basically following a step-by-step -step guide on how to perform the trick, and the only thinking portion is choosing the right trick in the first place. Even then, the game prevents you from choosing the wrong one. We successfully convince four students to do the experiment, and the doctor calls us. I'd like to mention that I'm not in control of her at this point of the game. For some reason, the game is saying, walk to this specific area before answering the phone. The doctor is actually surprised we got four out of the six Maybe students. The He's found one and Sam is the sixth. Exactly uh oh. Looks like we're getting closer to this experiment than we hoped for. We meet the doctor and he's straight out of the Phantom of the Opera with that mask. Other than that, he's completely normal and the experiment is nothing more than monitoring brain activity while you imagine a scenario. So there's nothing weird going on at all. At least until we read the morning newspaper and see that something suspicious happened at the local track, which was the scenario that we were imagining last night. You're standing in a field and your eyes are closed. It's night 
and the air is chilly. You're a little cold in the athletic suit you have on, but you know you'll be warming up soon. You smell freshly mown grass on the night breeze. It must be a complete coincidence, right? In the meantime, let's stalk our employer. There's obviously a reason why these rumors spread about him. We go to the Oxford Library, and we need a student ID to get in. Since we're already a fake new assistant, might as well be a fake new student too. We steal one of our new friend's spare IDs, and look up a bunch of news articles on the doctor. He's actually one of the top neurobiologists, and his wife died tragically in a car accident. She's the one in the portrait we saw earlier, and Mrs. Dalton told us not to ask any questions about it. Is that Dr. Stiles' daughter? If you want to get along in this house, that's the sort of thing you don't ask. Ever. Right, sorry. Well, that explains why he secluded himself away from the public. Maybe he went mad and now he's performing supernatural experiments on brains, right? We take the next step in snooping and talk to the doctor's boss. He confirms that losing his wife did mess him up and he stopped lecturing as a result. Someone started spreading rumors that he went crazy in his isolation, and that's why we couldn't find students earlier. In fact, the doctor did submit a detailed explanation of his experiment to his boss, and his boss sees nothing wrong with it, so I guess there must be nothing wrong with it after all. Sam assumes that the person spreading the rumors is in the neurobiology department, and we find out who it might be by who didn't sign the condolence card after, after the doctor's wife died. That just goes to show you that you should pretend to like a co-worker when his wife dies to avoid casting any suspicion on yourself. Also, the group of students is a little nervous about performing day two of the experiment because of the weird thing that happened on the track last night. Sam convinces them that it's just a coincidence and there's no way something like that could happen twice in a row. Chapter 3 takes a whole new perspective. We're playing as the doctor now. He's not suspicious at all. Most of the flavor text is him remembering his dead wife. In fact, most of what he does is trying to contact his wife's ghost. He uses a sensory deprivation chamber and an RNG machine instead. Now the sensory deprivation chamber fits into my willing suspension of disbelief, but the RNG machine just activates the math focus part of my brain. It works off of the concept that you're using your psychic energy to force random events in your favor. Almost like the heart of the cards from Yu-Gi-Oh, except it's psionic energy trying to display a message. So it starts off as setting the odds of rolling a blank card to 99%, and the remaining 1% is evenly distributed between the 26 letters of the alphabet. If you're psychic and concentrate hard enough, you can force a letter to appear. Judging by the slots on the machine, he's rolling 18 numbers. That means that there's about a 17% chance of any letter appearing in any place. The explanation you get sounds like because the odds are so low that getting anything to appear naturally is quote unquote impossible. Whatever, I can't think about this without going nuts. It gets even worse when you consider that the letters appear over time, as if the machine is constantly rolling numbers as the day goes on, and it just stops rolling numbers when one letter appears. Seeing the first two letters appear on the RNG machine convinces Dr. Stiles to look through his old photos with him and his wife. This one looks suspicious for reasons that I didn't mention because I feel like giving you a reason to play the game yourself. Adding Instagram filters to the scanned photos shows some weird ghost thing in the background. Dr. Stiles doesn't do much about this and day two of the experiment is underway. Tonight, you're at the swimming pool at St. Edmund. Your eyes are closed and you're standing on the rough cement surface. Nothing strange at all happens this time. Please ignore how the pool was dyed a deep shade of purple, by the way. At least everyone says it's purple. The newspaper is the only one that says it's blood red. It's even red in the picture. We make it to the pool and discover that the water is crystal clear. There's no trace of dye or anything. Even the pool filter from last night is clean. I guess it's time to investigate our friends and the other professor that didn't sign the condolence card. We lure the professor out of his office and bug his phone in hopes that he divulges some information. Next, we go to the dormitory and break into our friends' dorm rooms with magic, of course. First of all, these dorms are a lot richer than the ones I've been in. 
if there's anyone watching that actually lived in any of the Oxford dormitories, are the dorms really like this? The ones I stayed in were just big enough to fit two beds and about three feet of walking space separating them. One dorm I stayed in had very sensitive fire alarms too. One night it went off because it was raining too hard. It was going off so often that my roommate and I considered staying in the building instead of waiting outside in the freezing cold weather. We were calling the fire alarms bluff, and we were on the third floor. We didn't find anything too incriminating, but we do get caught red-handed. It's kind of embarrassing. She'll let us go in exchange for telling her what we found in the other dorms. That's a fair trade, I guess. In fact, if you break into her room first, you don't have to say anything. Tattling on your friends is literally just a bonus. Once we're done with that, we meet the students out on the lawn. They're a little apprehensive about showing up to the experiment this time, and we need to convince them with a little magic. We're back to playing as Dr. Styles for this chapter, and the RNG machine is working hard at giving us barely anything. What is it, Laura? Keep going, darling. Give me a few more letters. The doctor goes outside instead of using his sensory deprivation chamber. He spends his time in the park reminding himself of his dead wife. Laura, I can't do it. I can't get that flower. Ow! He takes a boat out onto the lake, and she jumps out of the water like Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th to tell him that something spooky happened in the accident years ago. This inspires the doctor to get to get hypnotized and force himself to remember the day of the accident. This is a kind of lame guessing game. You should know the right answers, since they're written down somewhere, but you don't have to remember the real answers at all. The game won't even let you select the wrong answers. What did you have? I can't remember. That's not right. The doctor has an epiphany and the bad 3D animation really gets shown off here. In the cutscene, the doctor is sitting up in a state of shock. And then, when we go back to the game, he's lying down, stiff as a board, just looking straight at the ceiling. We go back to the lab and check out the data from the test. Yeah, that's weird. Something seems to be messing with the brain scans at the exact time the pranks were pulled off. Uh, yeah, that's weird. It's time for the third experiment, and Sam is missing. She's actually hiding out in the gym waiting for the prankster to show up. She came prepared with a camera and even rigged the entrance with flash powder. Let's see how well the plan goes. Oh snap! Whoever's doing this means business! Sam wakes up and cleans up the prank, so fears aren't raised any further and she makes her way back to the doctor's house. Because she's gotta keep snooping for tomorrow! We manage to hear a conversation between the professor and his mistress. Sam uses it as blackmail and gets thrown out of the office. Young lady, you have five seconds to get out of this office before I call campus security. She even goes nuts on everyone else. We force someone to talk by ripping up this essay that's due today, break into someone else's drug stash, Get a person fired from his job? Nothing. I was just fired. And even call up someone's mother. Jeez. Don't get on Sam's bad side. The only person she doesn't mess with is the student with an obsession with the color pink and fairies. Now, everyone says that this is suspicious for some reason, but I mean, I don't know. There is no privacy when it comes to Sam. She also tells the doctor to move the experiment to an earlier time of day and change what the students are supposed to visualize. That way we can prove that Dr. Stylus has nothing to do with the pranks, assuming word of the last minute change doesn't get out. That way, if the prankster is reading off the doctor's experiment plan, we should see the prank happening in a place that we aren't visualizing, if that makes any sense. And just like that, nothing goes wrong and Sam leaves Oxford for some nightclub in London. I haven't mentioned it because there's a side plot going on where Sam is trying to find the location of a magician's nightclub. There's hints scattered around Oxford as to where it is, and I just haven't been mentioning it. Now that she's gone, we're playing as the doctor again. Also, anyone who doesn't want the end spoiled should leave now. 
I've been avoiding another big plot point, just so that way anyone who actually wants to play the game has something to look for. Everyone else who doesn't care just can stick around. As it turns out, something did happen during the experiment. You want to know how bad it was? No one died, but dang! We're sending people to the hospital. The inspector here doesn't have a clue as to what exactly happened here, but Dr. Stiles has a pretty good idea. Sam's lie also starts crumbling with Angela exposing her to the doctor. He talks to the doorman who has access to Oxford's student records, and even snoops through her belongings. He calls Sam's former caretaker from the orphanage that she belonged to, and finally figures out that Sam is an aspiring magician. We go to the local magic shop and find a poster advertising her performance at the exclusive Magician's Club. It seems a little strange to publicly advertise for something that you have to solve riddles to find. One of those riddles actually led Sam to the dining hall from Harry Potter. No, seriously, there's even a plaque on the wall. Certificate of Appreciation. The whole staff of the movie Harry Potter, Chamber of Secrets, would like to thank the Christchurch College for letting this magnificent room be portrayed as the now famous Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Dr. Stiles finds the club faster than Sam did and surprises her in the club's dressing room. He's not too happy about being lied to about being the new assistant, and he blames her for all the strange things that have been happening around Oxford. He leaves Sam and she wants to really prove that she's not the one behind everything. I don't like the final chapter. It looks visually fascinating with all the things you see, but it feels like it was rushed in development. The puzzles only feel slightly more complicated than the Dora the Explorer TV show. You know the kind. Dora asks the viewer, where do we go next? While there's a very clear road with no branching paths going off into the distance, and then these two bushes move out of the way to show the castle that we're going to in the background. And then, if you still can't figure it out, an arrow shows up on the screen and clicks on the castle. The puzzles are easy and tedious is what I'm trying to get at. It all leads up to the private section of the club and we pull out a gun on the magician from Oxford. We get the answers that we're looking for. And this is the last warning for anyone who doesn't want anything spoiled. David, it's Angela. Okay, so the plot point that I didn't mention is that Dr. Stiles thinks that his wife's ghost is walking around the house and showing up in his bed, his shower, his hey, staircase. I mean, hello? Hello? Who's there, please? Or not? And even makes out with her in the end. The game was dropping hints the whole time. She keeps an old magazine with a doctor and his wife on the cover, and her brain scan was the one causing the weird thing to happen around campus. Also, she's like pyrokinetic or something? And now she's burning down the church because she's having an identity crisis. Dr. Stiles tries to calm her down and promises to help her out, but the writers of this game don't like happy endings. The students involved with the experiment are the only ones that are told exactly what happened in the church. And the story ends with Sam staying in Oxford as the doctor's assistant. The story isn't exactly wrapped up in the prettiest bow, but it's still a good story nonetheless. I enjoyed the journey, and the only thing I wanted was harder puzzles. I'm not saying I want the famous cat hair mustache, but the puzzles in this game were mostly just following directions. You weren't really solving anything. The game wouldn't even let you do the wrong thing, so I still recommend the game and you should try it. Oh come on, what do you want, blood? I told you I'd delete your scene. And I'm supposed to trust you. Please, I'm whining now, I'm whimpering, you're killing me here. Maybe you'll think twice next time. I've nothing more to say to you.
Just in case anyone wanted to know, the RNG machine put up the last few letters way too late.